Uh, thanks again, and uh, I'll, I'll be making the presentation. Dr. Ospital is here if there's some questions on the health effects that come up uh, during my talk or later on. Uh, so uh, thanks again. Hello, everyone, again. Happy to be a, the bookend for the presentations this evening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple studies that AQMD has done specific to Santa Monica Airport. And I'll first talk about the first one that was done back in uh, 2006 and 2007. Uh, we received a grant from the US EPA to look at a, a variety of air toxic issues, and one of the projects within that grant was to look at general aviation airports, and we did work at Van Nuys Airport and Santa Monica Airport. Uh, the study was focused on long-term exposure. Earlier today, I showed you those maps of diesel PM uh, 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 and the risk, cancer risk associated with that. So what we did for these uh, studies under this grant was do the same type of sampling we did for those MATE studies. And those are really focused on long-term cancer risk. So while we had a few measurements that gave you kind of these short-term concentrations, most of this first study was looking at long-term risk. Uh, we did two three-month sampling periods at Santa Monica and again two three-month sampling periods at Van Nuys going back and forth. And the idea was to look at the potential impact of the airport emissions on what we measured in the community and then see if we can attribute that, uh, again, to different airport activity. Next slide. So why was Santa Monica Airport chosen? Uh, again, there's obviously a lot of community concerns. And uh, we know from this chart up in front of everyone that there's a, a much increased number of private jet traffic over the past you know, 10 to 20 years. Uh, the other unique part about Santa Monica Airport, and this is one of the reasons that uh, you know, EPA came here to do this study that you heard about is that you know, the, the proximity of the runway and the takeoff area and the blast vents to the community is really unique, at least in Southern California, if not the state or the country. Uh, most airports have a much larger buffer zone between aircraft activity and where people are living. So it's a, it's a, it's, it was a good place to look for these impacts in the community. Uh, so the way we designed the study was we kind of located sampling sites along the, the flight path, both you know, downwind and upwind. And then we had a few satellite sites off to the side. Again, you see these wind roses again showing that for most of the study that the winds lined up uh, just right along the runway, uh, blowing from uh, west to east. And uh, next slide. And this is just a close-up of that uh, blast fence area. You could see that it's about 250 feet from where the, the, the aircraft take off to the nearest residence. And where we sampled uh, our site three and site two was one at a residence uh, uh, in that neighborhood. And then we had another site that was actually on airport property right next uh, to the blast fence. Next slide. So uh, like Suzanne showed, uh, Professor Paulson showed, there was a wide variety of uh, measurements that we took. And again, this was modeled on kind of our regional air toxic studies. A few things we did differently was we added ultrafines to this. We also had some carbon monoxide measurements. Uh, but in general, we tried to follow what we've done in MATES, again, designed to look at long-term exposure and long-term risk. Next slide. Uh, so I'm going to kind of give you the punchline first, the summary of the findings. Uh, again, and you've heard from other studies and uh, other people here that the lead levels in the community and near the runways, uh, while they're below even the new federal standards, as was shown in the EPA study, but they were elevated. The closer you are to that takeoff area, the higher the lead levels were, although it did not exceed uh, the standard. We did have over three months of measurements that's easier to compare to those national standards. And when you average it out, it did not exceed. But again, it was anywhere from five to 10 times higher uh, than uh, background levels would have been. When we looked at kind of the more traditional pollutants, carbon monoxide, PM, uh, the, those organic gases I talked about earlier, another class of compounds called carbonyls, we really couldn't, uh, we couldn't see the impact of the airport uh, on long term and long term samples uh, that we took. Uh, it's not to say that they weren't emitted, uh, but when they're emitted in, uh, in short term bursts when uh, aircraft activity is occurring. And uh, when that gets averaged over all that time in between the takeoffs and all the clean air at night, uh, that you kind of lose that signal uh, again. But a lot of these compound, a lot of these pollutants are looked at for long-term risk, so you have to integrate that risk over a long-term exposure. Uh, and again, the, the final finding was ultrafine particles. Again, I've mentioned earlier uh, by number concentration, they're significantly elevated near the runways during aircraft operations. 
both short-term speak uh, short-term peaks as well as if you average it over the entire study you you still see uh, highly uh, elevated levels near the runways and in that community uh, next slide so these are some lead results uh, over the two phases, one phase in uh, kind of the spring, another phase uh, in the winter, uh, and you can see what we call a gradient, higher levels where the source is, and then as you move away, it goes down. We got an 85, and then it goes down to 28 in the community, and about four and a half further away, and then as you go upwind, you're down in the threes. Again, the, the federal standard is 150. We never exceeded that. We're at 85 or 77, but again, you, you see what we call a gradient as, as, as concentrations drop off as you move away from the source area. For comparison, I mean, we get pretty low levels of lead in, in West LA. Downtown LA, we get somewhere between you know, 9 and 15 on average. Uh, and over the whole basin, we get about 9. So these are, these are higher levels. These are definitely influenced by the uh, aviation gas and the propeller airplane, uh, the propeller uh, driven aircraft at the airport. Again, the jet fuel does not have lead in it. So these are driven by the smaller, the smaller planes that have uh, traditional engines. Next slide. Again, now I have a lot of slides like this that look very similar to Professor Paulson's slides. So these are kind of our short-term data. Again, ultra-fine particles. Uh, we see that you get the peaks. Uh, these, this is multiple days. So what you're seeing in the red and the blue are uh, our, our one hour average of those things and you're seeing kind of the daily cycles when the airport is open versus when the airport is not is closed at night so that's what you see those little red peaks moving across multiple days and we can show when we zoom in that those peaks correspond primarily to aircraft takeoffs the other thing you could see is that um, we get the highest peaks at the East Tarmac site, which is on airport property next to the blast fence. And then uh, those peaks are mirrored, although sometimes at a lower level, uh, at the residents in that nearby community about 300 feet downwind. Next slide. Again, if we zoom in even more, this shows sp specific uh, times where we knew an aircraft was taking off. The highest levels are on the bottom uh, at the East Tarmac site. Again, some of those are mirrored in the community. And then if you look at the upper two, uh, the scale on those has been blown up by a factor of 10. If it was on the same scale, you wouldn't even see those peaks. So as you move further away at Richland School or on the west side, those, you, can't, you don't see evidence of those takeoff events at all. Uh, what you're probably seeing there, then those peaks are, are, are uh, vehicles, motor vehicles on roadways driving by. But uh, definitely in the community downwind, you see those peaks. Uh, next slide. Um, again, some of the more traditional pollutants that are regulated, we looked at particulate matter, and right here you're seeing all the Santa Monica airport sites compared to, say, a central LA site, which we use for comparison. And in general, we don't see the influence of particulate matter uh, mass. This is what's regulated, PM 2.5, uh, or some components of particulate matter, uh, like elemental carbon, which is similar to black carbon, or organic carbon. In general, you're lower than or equivalent to what you'd expect in the basin, and you don't see the gradients, like the higher levels near the near the, uh, the emission area versus further away that you'd expect if, if it was a major emission problem. And particulate matter, as it's regulated is, of mass, most of that is, if you remembered my earlier talk, is, is formed secondarily in the atmosphere. So when you're next to a source, even a combustion source, you don't get a lot of particulate matter mass. If you're next to a busy, busy freeway, you might see an increase of 5 or 10% over background. So this isn't surprising that you wouldn't see the impact on a pollutant like this next to a source. Uh, next slide. Again, these are those organic gases, and again, the same type of comparison to some companion sites in downtown LA. Again, very equivalent numbers to what you'd see elsewhere in the basin. You don't see the, the gradient, whether you're close to the tarmac or not. Uh, again, you don't see a big influence from these, but remember, these are long-term average and long-term exposure measurements. We're not looking at what happens over the two minutes or five minutes that an aircraft is uh, running up and taking off. Over to the right, we took some samples over different parts of the day, and you kind of see this typical pattern uh, that you see elsewhere in the basin where you get higher levels in the morning and, a little, and, a, and some high levels in the evening during rush hour. No, we did not look at naphthalene in this study. 
Um, when you, we did take some samples that we call instantaneous, which are not long-term samples. So when my staff was out there, you know, doing their maintenance on the instrumentation, uh, and they, and a jet was taking off, you can smell it. There's no doubt you can smell it. You know a jet is taking off. We can take a very quick sample, analyze that, and see what's in there. So we can compare uh, what we got there to what's uh, some typical published, what we call emission profiles of the types of pollutants you would see uh, in jet exhaust. And it corresponds, on the left there, you see what typical jet exhaust is, and you see what we sampled on the east tarmac during idling and takeoff and on the bottom there, and, and, and those profiles are very similar. When we compare it to diesel exhaust or, uh, uh, or gasoline vehicle exhaust, you don't get a correspondence. So what we measured is what you'd expect from jet exhaust on a short-term basis when a jet was taking off. Short-term. Next slide. So again, our first study was focused more on a long-term exposure. Uh, but with, you know, Professor Paulson's findings and uh, some requests from the community and others that we make some recommendations for can we somehow reduce some of these exposures, we came back uh, to do a short study uh, uh, last year from September to, uh, 9th to October 5th. And it was a, a study of opportunity, we call it, because there was a runway closure in the middle of that study uh, that, where there was no aircraft activity. So what we had is a before, during, and after the closure to compare what we found in the community. Again, instead of doing the long-term study, which we you know, didn't find much on the, kind of some of the long-term exposure metrics. Uh, we focused on ultrafine and black carbon because we knew on a short-term basis those were where we would find the signal. And uh, we, what we wanted to do was relate what we found to actual aircraft type and aircraft activity so we could provide some basis for at least some educated guess on what could, might be done or studied to perhaps mitigate some of those neighborhood exposures. So next slide. So we came back to the airport, but again, we focused on the area where we knew we had uh, some, you know, we had found before those elevated levels. So we just located at that East Tarmac site, we went to the same residence in the community we were at before, and we actually went inside the residence this time because we wanted to know if these particles or pollutants were making it inside. If we were going to make some kind of recommendation that, you know, some filters be installed in a house or high efficiency filters, we need to know that, that's, that those particles are actually making it inside and a lot of studies have shown these very, very small particles actually aren't very efficient at infiltrating inside houses. Uh, so you can see on the upper left, again, the winds lined up perfectly for our study uh, right along the runway blowing down wind. <coughs> Next slide. Again, results aren't inconsistent with what we found before. This time we did make continuous black carbon measurements that were not made before. Again, those peaks definitely correspond to aircraft activity, uh, both in ultrafine particles and black carbon. You can see that ultrafine particles and black carbon kind of go up and down with each other. Uh, so both are being emitted from these uh, aircraft takeoffs. Uh, over on the right, you could see when the runway closure was. And you could see those patterns that we see every day in both ultrafine and black carbon basically disappeared during the runway closure. As soon as the uh, airport opened back up, we have some missing data down to the right, but in general you see a huge difference between when there's no aircraft activity, when there is aircraft activity, not a surprise, but it, it's, it does demonstrate and really show that there is that impact. The other thing you could see on the right if you look at the bottom of each set of three there is that for the black carbon and the ultrafine, not a lot of it was making it indoors. And uh, obviously if you had more windows open and all your doors open, more of it would make it indoors. But these are very, very small particles that uh, for particle physics reasons uh, do not tend to infiltrate indoors as, as much as some of the larger particles uh, might infiltrate indoors. So uh, that was another finding uh, that it, you know, in some cases it might be better to stay indoors uh, when uh, the jets are taking off. Next slide. <laughs> not that, not saying, not, not saying you should have to do that. <laughs> okay, let me take my foot out of my mouth. I'm just showing the findings that, you know, in case you were worried that even inside you're getting those exposures. Anyway, okay, so what else we, well, the other stuff we looked at was uh, how um, the, 
uh, how, how these peaks in ultrafine particles and black carbon um, uh, varied with the type of aircraft and the aircraft activity. So what you see here is the three classes of aircraft we called class A, class B, class C. The class C aircraft are the largest. And as the size of the aircraft goes up, as Professor Paulson showed, we get higher peak concentrations in both black carbon and in ultrafine particles. And again, a little higher at the east tarmac than at in, in, uh, the resident, in the backyard of the residence. But it does correspond. You get more emissions of both these pollutants from the, from the, higher, uh, from the, from the heavier aircraft with the larger engines. Um, and you can see more or less that the, when you're next to the blast fence, you're about twice as high, more or less, than what you were getting about 300 feet away at the residence. Next slide. The other thing we looked at was different uh, airport act aircraft activities. So we have taxi, we kept very close track with the cooperation of the airport who collected this data for us, uh, of taxi time, and then the first uh, hold time, the last two minutes of hold time, which includes run up, and then takeoff. So you can see that, uh, in this case for ultrafine particles, that you know during taxi you get the, the lowest emissions. Uh, during that hold time, uh, it starts to go up. But it's really that last uh, two minutes of hold time, which includes the run up of the engines, where we saw pretty much the highest concentrations. And actually during takeoff, they may, in some cases, drop a little bit, at least for the, uh, the smaller aircraft. Another thing to notice in the far right here is that the uh, takeoff, uh, when the takeoff is occurring, that's when the engines are going full bore and it's really blowing the emission, you know, it's creating its own wind, basically. So that's when the concentrations at the blast vents are more similar to the concentrations uh, in the residence because uh, it, um, you know, the, the the particles are moving really quickly towards the residence before they have a chance to dilute and disperse. So that last column shows a, a greater similarity between the two concentrations at the two locations. So while at the tarmac, say for the larger aircraft, as you move farther away, uh, you know, it, it, it may drop off during takeoff for the, um, because of that effect, they may actually increase for takeoff for the larger engines in the, in the community. Uh, next slide. So we made some, uh, you know, these are educated guess recommendations. It's not like we've studied these things, but based on what we know about uh, the study and particle physics, these are things that may help mitigate some of the problems in the community. Uh, one thing is the blast fence covers where the planes are taking off, uh, but it doesn't necessarily provide a barrier between where the taxi occurs or where the, some of the run-up occurs. To the extent you can deflect some of the emissions, perhaps increasing the width of the blast fence, you probably can't increase the height because of safety reasons, but that's one thing to look at that might have a, a beneficial effect. I know when the blast fence was put in many years ago that had a, uh, that had a beneficial effect, at least from what I've heard from the community, uh, the blast fence that exists today. Um, we found that the holding times were what, some of the times that had some of the higher emissions, so the extent you can reduce those holding times and reduce the run-up, uh, that, that could be helpful as well. Um, Maybe there's a way to redirect that exhaust from the pre-flight run-up and test. Maybe, you know, if the, if the engines weren't exhausting towards the community at that time, uh, it would be, a, it can provide some benefit. And then again, we found that the larger commuter planes, the, the Class C, were responsible for the majority or the highest level of emissions. And if there was any way to do that, I know there's complications with that, you know, that would potentially reduce exposure. Um, I think that's all I had, so. I'd Thank you.